Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. We will begin the webinar now. Um, uh, we have scheduled this session today dominantly for building your resume for the graduate application. My name is Omar Bashir, and I am an Education USA advisor based in the Karachi office. Our session today is for anyone who is trying to get into graduate school and trying to build their resume. The session will have polls um, where you would get a chance to answer a question with a yes or no. Please do engage um, in the polls. That would give us a better insight of you as a student. And then we will have a Q&A session towards the end of the session where you are more than welcome to put any questions you may have in the Q&A session as I will take questions from there only. So let's start. A brief introduction about what Education USA is. Education USA is a part of Department of State Network with over 435 international student advising centers in more than 175 countries and territories. The network promotes higher education in the, in the US and we are your official source of information for higher education in the United States. We also offer free advising services. You can go online on our webpage and sign up for free advising services. We also have an app now where you can access our frequently asked questions. You can also chat with the advisors during the work hours. It just works like a WhatsApp. You just have to download it from the Apple Store or App Store. Um, and you can also get events and alerts on, on the app. So if you research the college application process, it can be a little bit daunting. However, Education USA has broken down um, the US college application process into five simple steps and Education USA advisors assist students in all five steps. Today, we are going to focus on the third step, which is complete your application. We are not, uh, we are only going to uh, focus on part of completing your application and of that is building your resume. Next week, we are having another session. I'm hosting another session where you can sign up for your five steps to study in the US. And we will discuss all these five steps in details. So now I'm going to launch a poll for you to answer a question for us. So if you can um, answer yes or no on the screen, uh, that would be great. I will give about uh, 10 more seconds for you to answer. Wow, that's, that's a big number. I think by this time, most of you have answered. So I will share the results on the screen. So about 74% today, 74% uh, of audience today has built a resume in the past and 26% of audience have not built a resume in the past, which is okay because, you know, not everyone needs a resume, but when you're trying to get into a graduate school or if you're trying to find a job, then the resume is a must. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing the poll results and we're going to move forward. So we're, we are going to talk about why do you need a resume when you're getting into a grad school? So a resume is basically an introduction and a description about you and it helps to stand out if, if, if you apply for a job or if you're applying for a school, right? And it's also make you stand out from all the other applicants who have applied for the graduate school or if they have applied for the job. Most graduate school have uh, requirements of, um, they have a requirement for your students to submit their resume and along with all the other documents. And um, with resume, it opens a door for you to avail a lot of opportunities. Also, you can get assistantships at the graduate level and fellowships at a PhD level. So it's a very good tool to have in hand, uh, just in case when you're going to school. So in Pakistan, I have noticed that a lot of people are using the term CV. And, and there's a big difference between CV and a resume. And we will talk about both of them today. And I will show you how to build both of these. And by the end, 
uh, we are going to have a full resume ready for you to take a look at it. It's not hard to make a resume or a curriculum vitae. It's just that you need to know what information you need to put in it. So a CV uh, is um, more likely needed when you are applying for a PhD program. It's a Latin word, which means course of life. Course of life means that you need to provide details on your CV. Uh, that would be your professional uh, skills. That would be your experiencing experiences, your skills, and your education. You have to go in detail. You can brag about them, but you have to brag a little humbly. And then your CV shouldn't be more than two pages. You have it should you can you can do two pages or more. It just depends on what you have done. It shouldn't be more than at least five pages. If you have done your PhD, you're applying for a second PhD, then we would know why your CV is so long. So on the other hand, a resume is needed when you're applying for a graduate school. And a resume is also needed when you're applying for a job. So it's a French word, uh, which means summary. So it's going to be a summary of what you have done. It's going, it's going to be a summary of what you have done as a person, of, of who you are as a person. Uh, so when you're applying for grad school, you need to make sure what the grad school is asking for. Either they're asking for a CV or a resume. Uh, make sure the resume shouldn't be more make a goal of that resume shouldn't be more than one page because after one page the admissions committee is going to lose track um, so make sure that you just try to concise your resume to one page two pages at maximum but not more than that but my re personal recommendation would be one page so <clears throat> there's the different sections in the resume and a cv that you should have um, the very top portion of your CV where you include your name and your contact details is called the header. That's going to be a very important section. That's how the admission committee or the person who's like a uh, hiring manager would know the, the person's name and where they're located, okay? Right after that, you're going to add professional summary. A lot of people also call this as an objectives of who you are as a, pers a person, uh, but highly recommended that you use the word professional summary and I will uh, explain you how to write a professional summary and what to include in it and what it is. Um, I write after that section a lot of people add skills but then their skills can be used in different ways uh, you know one word can have different meaning so skills can be skills can have several different types of me uh, meaning so we would say highlights and I will tell you what highlights are Highlights are basically who you are as a person, and I will tell you how to more how to elaborate more on it. After you type, uh, after you write your highlights in your CV or resume, you're going to start writing down your experience and internship that you have, like your work experience, your volunteer work, and all that kind of stuff. After your experience and internships, you're going to talk about your education. Uh, right after that, if you have any professional certificates that you have obtained or any skills that you may have, you can write that down. And then publications, if you have any publications, and this is needed for a CV when you're applying for a PhD school, um, after publications, you get into conferences, if you have attended any conferences or any have presented at those conferences. And we will talk in details of every single box that you see on your screen right now. And then... Um, we are going to talk about professional affiliations and memberships and stuff of that nature. At this point, I'm going to issue a post another poll for you where I would like to ask you a question. Please answer it in a yes or no. There you go. So we'll give about 10 to 15 seconds uh, for people to participate. Wow, these responses are really uh, good. <laughs> so, okay, at this time, most of the people have answered in the, in the audience. Slash, I'm going to sh end the poll now and share the results with you. 
So about 63% people in the audience today knew what a CV was and 37% of did not know. Uh, even I took very long to understand what was the difference between CV and resume when I was getting into grad school, given the note that I was already in the US, uh, it could be confusing at time, but that's okay. That's what we are here for. So I will stop sharing the results and we will move on to the sections of your CV and resume. So the first one uh, I'm going to talk about is going to be your header. Your header is going to include the following details. It's going to have your full name. Uh, even if you have a middle name, people like to put some people have middle names and they just like to put the initials of their name. Uh, we recommend that you completely spell out your full name. Now, if you have, um, don't put nicknames in your name. This should, then if your full name should match your passport name. Then comes permanent address. Uh, put in the address that you live in, uh, but we don't recommend that you put your house number and we don't uh, recommend that you put your apartment number. You can just put in your street name and the state or city and the zip code that you live in. After your permanent address, we recommend students to write down their email address. Now, when you're at putting your email address on your resume, make sure that you are, you are putting a very well organized email a lot of people i've seen in the resumes are putting very vulgar names like um ice cream cone at gmail.com uh, behind the tree at hotmail.com happy guy at gmail.com so let's just avoid these kind of email addresses and if you don't have uh an email address that has your first and last name we highly recommend that you create one um because that shows how professional you are after e email address, we have to put your phone number. When you're putting your phone number, make sure you're putting your country code next to it. Uh, for Pakistan, it's 92, and then your phone number. Avoid the zero and then move on with the number, and then just add on to that. If you have a LinkedIn profile, that would be great. You can add a link to your uh, resume. It's going to help you and the admission committee and uh, learn about each other. So we highly recommend students to have a LinkedIn profile because it's a great platform to network professionally with employers and um, faculty members of the school. So it's a great idea to put it down there. So I'm going to show you an example of how the header of a resume should look like. Okay, so this is how should it looks like. Um, your name is going to come in the very top. And then your address, 123 USA Road, that's going to be the street name, the city where you're living and the state and the zip code of the of that particular city um, and the country that you live in. I have used US as an example, assuming that you will want to, you will move to the US and start applying for schools later on, maybe for PhD. Um, international dialing code for the US numbers are plus one, and then the number that you have. And then Jane Doe is just an example that we are using. You don't have to be to Jane Doe, just use your own name. Uh, put in your email address exactly. You know, you can make sure you use your first and last name in your email. And then your LinkedIn um, profile, you can go ahead and add that. That's really, really, really helpful. And also when you are writing all this information, we recommend you do it in the order and not just put your address first and then add your name in the bottom. So have your name first, the address, and then the phone number, your email address, and the link to the profile. We're moving on to the next session of professional summary in the resume. So professional summary basically sums up your work experience, the skills you may have, and achievements into a short and concise sales pitch where you are the product and you're trying to sell yourself in the market. So how you can write a summary for your resume? is you're going to condense your details and, and be consistent and highlight your top qualifications. So pro professional summary is something that the, the admissions committee, committee is going to review because you're telling them who you are professionally and what you are doing. And it's, going, it's a good way to put a good impression uh, at first. So make your adjustments based upon which school and what program you're applying for. And it should, a professional summary should be something unique about yourself. Do not copy your neighbor's professional summary. Have your own professional summary ready, okay? 
So I'm going to share um, an example of a professional summary with you. So I'm going to read it with you. This professional summary is great. Uh, we know by the first letter, bilingual, which means that Kristen speaks more than one language. It says for bilingual leader who performs well in multinational environment, highly effective, of, effective at incorporating creative leadership skills to achieve business objectives, seeking a mid-level position where I can develop my professional experience to achieve company's goal. So this is a great professional summary that uh, this candidate is trying that this candidate has written to apply for a job. So if you are if you were to compose this for your school, you just add you fix it around this uh, along these lines, and you can say I'm looking to get into the grad school for this particular program, and then you would add what you have what you have done, like a highlight, a brief highlight about yourself. Okay. So here is a highlight. Highlights in your resume would be your key skills that you're composed, uh, that are composed of you as a personality, as a human, and your strengths. We, we recommend students to use active verbs here. You don't use sentences that I am a great uh, at football, I am great at uh, multitasking, I am great at typing, I'm great in computer skills. No, we are, they're not looking for this type of sentences. They're looking for active verbs and I will show it to you how, um, how to write it down. And then tailor it to the position or the school or the program that you're applying for. Look into their application requirements, what type of highlights, what, what is their ideal candidate, and then tailor your highlights based to that. And then they have softwares where these software detects candidates or students based upon their um, key skill, based on their highlights. So just make sure you incorporate that in your resume. So next slide is going to show you examples and skills of skills or highlights um, that you can mention in your resume. So these are all active words like this person is observant, they can multitask, uh, they have written very well Microsoft Office expert, you don't have to mention word expert, Excel expert, PowerPoint expert, access expert, Microsoft Office should be good enough time management, staff development, organized, conflict resolution, powerful negotiator, and team leadership. It's stuff of that nature. You don't need sentences. Next on your resume would be your experience and work history. Brag about it, but brag humbly and concisely. Uh, include everything that you have done. Uh, we recommend that you put in your eight years of service on your resume. Uh, no more than 10 years uh, on your resume. People say that uh, you can add up to 10 years. That's true. But then if you can add that experience, if it really add icing on the tape, uh, on the cake. So it does go up to eight years so that people don't get distracted and keep saying why he's jumping from jobs to job. You, you don't want to raise a question. So add full-time and part-time jobs. Yes, you can add part. You can add part-time jobs because that's an experience that you have gained working in the field. If you have any research experience in 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 the past or teaching experience in the past, please add on to that. And if you have done any kind of internships, whether it be paid or and unpaid, add on to your experiences. And then if you have done any community service, volunteer work, go ahead and add on to that. This is where they're going to see what you have done in the past and uh, what you're doing currently in, in, in the industry. So when you are writing these experiences down in your resume, we recommend that you use a chronolo chronological uh, way where you're putting your recent uh, job first and you're going in the second recent second and the third recent third uh, but you will just start from the current job and you will keep going backwards some other things that you will add um, in your resume in the reverse chrono chronological order is you're going to put your job title or the position you had. You, of course, want to put down how much uh, uh, how long did you work from them um, and, the, of course, organization's name and location that you were working for. So this is going to be an experience example. Uh, you can see this person has worked from August of 2020 to current. They're working as an administrative assistant at ABC Company, and they're working in Manhattan, New York. They have listed 
four things that they're working. It is impossible as an administrative assistant in New York that you only do four things in a job. Um, it's great that you're just highlighting the main things you were doing, and then you can leave the rest of your um, work duties to discuss in the interview, the important ones. You can discuss them in the interview and leave us some suspense for the committee. And then the second um, experience this person had was that they worked from July 2018 to July 2020, and they were a secretary at XYZ Company in Manhattan, New York. Again, they have highlighted very few things that they were doing as a secretary. It's highly unlikely that they only did three things. They did more, but they didn't put it in their experience because they would like to talk about it during their interview. So these are some things that will make you stand out and make the admissions committee a little interested about you by not putting every single detail that you did at your job and that will prolong your resume and probably make your resume to 20 pages and we don't want that we need one page maximum two page maximum so the next thing that you're going to write in your uh, resume is going to be education this is a good section to brag again what you have uh, learned in the past uh brad I'm, I'm repeating myself brag but brag humbly um, this is a very important section when you're applying to graduate school the committee will review this section thoroughly if you uh, a lot of people say that if i'm taking a class right now and i have not graduated uh, i graduated six i will graduate six months in advance now go ahead and add it um, if you're graduating let's say in july you're graduating in august go ahead and add that education on your resume but do put on a date when you're graduating like um, august of 2023 sort of that nature so you're also in your education education section you're going to write which type of degree you got and when you when was the degree conferred upon you you're going to once you put that information you're going to add the name of the institution you attended and city and state and again we are going to use the reverse chron chronological order where the most recent goes first okay um, if you have a project or thesis that you have worked in the past that is relevant you can add it um, to this uh, section if not then it's not important uh, it's completely fine you don't have to worry about it and this is also optional so also one thing I would like to point out when you're putting your education, a lot of students are confused. Should I put my GPA? If you're applying for a graduate school, if your GPA is at least 3.7 at a scale of 4.0, then I will highly recommend that you add your GPA on your education if you have graduated from that institution. If you have not graduated from the institution and you will be graduating in the next six months, then please do not add your current GPA because that's not the final GPA. So this is an example of the education here. Um, the student has been enrolled in the school from January 1st, 2020, and they will be graduating in May of 23 with Masters of Business Administration. And within the MBA, their concentration is finance and they're attending ABC University in Boston, Massachusetts. So this is a great way you can add your education on it. If you have already completed a degree, then it's going to look something like that. May, they started in May, uh, May of 2015, uh, all the way till May of 2019. They got their bachelor's of business administration. Their concentration is again finance. They went to ABC University in Boston, Massachusetts. There is no ABC University in Boston, in case you're wondering. It's just for this uh, webinar purposes, um, purposes, we just created something. Next thing we were talking about was professional certificates um, and skills. Here you can, skills could be anything added that you have uh, that could be language, or if you have um, taken any computer classes um, or any software classes, then you can go ahead and add that to your resume. Not everyone will have certificates and it's okay to leave this section um, if you don't have any kind of certifications. However, uh, if you're applying in the US, uh, you do have a skill, uh, which is a language. Uh, you do know Urdu and I'm assuming you do know English because you're trying to go to the US for your further higher education, especially at the graduate level. So that becomes a skill. You don't need a certificate in a language which you have already known. Um, it can be tested on later. So you can add that to your resume. 
And then I will talk more about uh, language in the next slide. <clears throat> if you have obtained any kind of certificates, uh, like a computer certificate, it is very important that you mention where you got it from and which institution you went to and the title of that particular certificate that you achieved. And these uh, type, uh, all of them are going to be a brief sentences. They're not going to be paragraph uh, where you're explaining what you did in the program while you were obtaining the certificate and stuff of that nature. Uh, we're not going to do that. We're just going to tell them a little bit and then we can elaborate more on the, on the stuff when we go for our interview. So this is going to be an example of your professional certificate or your skills. Um, this person, language skills, they have written down English and Urdu, they're fluent. Uh, please, please, this is like very important, uh, only list those languages that you know how to read and write. That's very important because they can always test your language skills. They don't, they want to make sure that the person is not lying and they're fluent in both reading and writing. This person has also done a certification. They did introduction to artificial intelligence and they did, they did it from Coursera and they did it in June of 2021. <clears throat> so this is an important part as well. Okay, so we are going to move on to the next slide and we're going to talk about publications. Um, it's very typical, it's not usual for people who are applying for a master's degree to have any publications because you just have completed your undergrad. Uh, but if you do have publications, you're more than welcome to add it to your CV. But this slide is more for students who are trying to apply for a PhD program if you have any publications. If you don't have any publications, you don't have to worry about it because PhD itself is going to teach you how to research and then publish your work. But if you're applying for a PhD, then it is a great idea to brag humbly on your publications. There's, as I said, there is nothing to worry about if you don't have it. But if you have it, it's going to be, it's going to be good and it's going to work in your favor. Also, uh, make sure you are using the citations properly. What type of citations is required? You will find out at your school's website that you're applying at, and you would only include the peer review journals and electronic publications. And if it's electronic or if it's electronic, uh, you have to specify it. So the next slide is going to show you how to write a publication. So this is a publication done by uh, Dorothy Bauer and B. Job. Um, they are, it's not one person, they're two person, they have, it's co-author publication, and they both worked on burnout and the young parent, and it's a journal of applied psychology, and they worked on five pages, it's a volume 15, they worked on five pages, for, and it's pages 38 to 49, and published in 2016. So you just need to know what type of formatting is required and you will the most common formatting in the US is APA format or MLA format. So you will find that answer from your school's website, what type of formatting that would be required. And based on that, you will create your publication in your CV. So the next slide is going to talk about conferences. Not a lot of students have attended conferences uh, and that is okay. It's not going to count against you. We, this section can be both in a resume and a curriculum vitae, which is a CV. Um, if you don't have it, it's completely fine. Uh, when you are adding a conference in your CV or a resume, we recommend that you add those conferences where you presented. Don't add those conferences where you were just where you just attended and you heard what the speaker was talking about. We highly recommend to add those that where you presented about a title or a work you did or a project. So um, when you are writing your conference in your resume, type the name of the presentation first that you did. This should match the whatever was printed in the program. Uh, page and list the list and listed on the, their online program page and type of, and type the name of the um, of the conference and in, in italic font and use the official conference title don't use don't don't try to be um don't try to create a different title just have the same title that was published and advertised to the public at that time 
Okay, so this is going to be an example of your conference, International Business and Changing Marketplace. And the topic was celebration of scholarship and learning town at the Towns uh, University in Townsend in October, 2021. So this is what an example would look like. So next comes grants, awards, and honors. Uh, let me briefly explain what a grant, award, and honor is. A grant is something if you were working on a project and you have received money to do that project, uh, that's a grant. An award is something that you have received at your school, and an honors is something that you have been, like if you have been an ordinary student or you have been on a dean's list or you have been an honors list, so that's the difference between these three. A lot of students will not have grants um, when you're applying for a graduate degree. The, it can be either master's or PhD. It just depends uh, what you have been doing in the past. If you have completed your master's and you have been, been given a grant, then it's great to add that to your um, profile. But when you are adding the grant in your profile, make sure to add the grant uh, amount it could be five, uh, it could be 50,000 rupees, right? You got a grant in Pakistan to work on a specific project and the, the, the organization gave you 50,000 rupees and you would like to put that in your CV. Convert that 50,000 rupees at the dollar rate at the time you receive the grant. And if the grant is more than $10,000, hypothetically speaking, that's when you will put it on your CV. If it was less than that, then it's, it's okay to put it, but it's not recommended. But if you would like to brag it, brag it humbly. If you have received any awards, uh, these awards could also be scholarship awards that you have received in your um, at your school. Um, this could be any kind of other awards that you have received. It could be academic accomplishment award that you can list. But please, when you're listing these awards, make sure you are listing anything beyond your high school because in high school, we have a lot of different awards for every single thing. So we don't want to include that in our resume. We would include those awards only that was post high school. And rank these uh, awards in order and the dates that you got and then keep the details brief you don't have to talk about if you got an award scholarship award you don't need to talk about who the scholarship belonged to what it was what is the history you can just name the scholarship and the, the financial award of that particular scholarship so this is going to be an example this person got an award the grant in 2021 um and the grant award was twelve thousand dollars so this is something that it's an example for you guys okay i will just give you a minute to take a look at this award and then we will move forward okay. so moving on next thing is going to be your professional affiliations and membership it is okay if you don't if you're not a part of any kind of professional affiliations or memberships in, an, in a club or organization, but some of you might belong to professional bodies and it's a great idea to be in if it's related to your field. If you're trying to do something in business field, if you are in United Nations, World Health Organization, it's great. But if you're trying to do something in engineering, then you need to find something specific. Um, organizations uh, could be anything between UN, United Nations, World Health Organization's American Counseling Center Association. To narrow it down locally in the in the Pakistan, there is ASAC um, organization, there is Citizens Foundations, there is Teach for Pakistan, there is Global Shapers, and many others organizations that are nationally nationally and internationally recognized. So when you're when you're writing these kind of affiliations and your memberships in your resume, make sure you're spelling out um, the whole uh, organization. Like if it's United Nations, don't just put UN, put United Nations. If it is WHO, World Health Organization. So stuff of, stuff of that nature, to spell the whole thing. And then you're going to tell them for how long were you a member in that particular membership. 
So this is an example of a professional affiliations or membership. This person is a member of Society of Forensic and Analytical Scientists from 2018 to present. And then this person is also a member in Microbiology Society, which is based in Europe from 2019 to present. So this is how you can put in your professional affiliations or memberships in your resume. When you go to the US, um, there is a, at the graduate level, you can get into Honors Society. It's a great membership. It's going to cost a little bit. If your GPA is high enough, you get invited to apply for that particular society. And that society, they will help you build your resume. Um, they will help you find jobs. They will help you find internships. They will. It's basically a very good society for you to avail opportunities out there in the US. And I was a member of one of those society and it greatly helped me to build up my professional profile. So I, I would recommend you if you guys have the financial means, go ahead um, and apply if you get invited to get to accept that offer. So we just built a resume. So this is what your resume is going to look like. A um, lot of people are asking me if we should put our references in the resume. Uh, no, don't put your, ref we recommend don't put your re references in the resume because if someone is interested in you, they will ask you for the references. So you are more than welcome to take a picture of this screen. And then uh, this is a final product for the resume that we just built. And then the next one is going to be the curriculum vitae that we have just created. So this is how these two things are going to look like. And this is how different they're going to look like. So I will just give you a second to look at it and then we will move forward. Okay. So now we are going to talk about how to format your resume, right? So you can either, when once you open a Word document or if you're using a template of a Word document, please go ahead and set your margins in the beginning or in the end, don't mess up your resume in the middle. But recommendations are that you start formatting, start your outline format in the beginning where you're setting your margins to one inches on all sides, uh, to the all sides, yes. And you can find this feature in the paragraph section of the word. And then make sure the line spacing should be wide enough, not make sure nothing is like uh, hopping on each other, they should be wide enough so they can, it's, they're readable. And then use business fonts um, such as Arial, Times New Roman, and Calibri. Do not use any fancy fonts that even you are not able to understand what you just composed. So just use very simple things. Um, Times New Roman is your best friend. Uh, if you were to ask me what should be the font size, the font size could be either 11 or 12. But then you just make sure that you make your name look a little bigger so it can little so it can pop out a little bit. Uh, use action words, active word, words, as we mentioned, and then create an original resume template. Do not borrow a resume from your friend. Do not borrow it from your uncle or your neighbor. Create an original format uh, of template of your resume. On Word, Doc, and Microsoft Word, there are a lot of templates. Just use that because the thing what happens is when you're borrowing someone else's template and you're trying to create your own, the formatting is going to really give you a hard time. That's why we recommend students to get your own original template. So Tom, some tips that we are going to give you um, is... Make sure that it, it's easy to read. I, we know that we like to impress people. So don't use so fancy word that is so out of dictionary that even you are not able to understand once you have composed. And then highlight your most relevant experience to the one to the to the school that you're applying to. If you did something great 10 years ago, um, you did it 10 years ago, let's see how it's going to weigh now. So make sure you are making it relevant to what you're applying for. If you're applying for something into a business field, make sure you list that and not just, let's say you're applying for a business school, but you have experience in um, psychology. You don't have to put psychology experience in there. If you have worked in a business field, make sure you put that. So make sure you prioritize 
your experiences based upon which program you're applying for. And then optimize for applicant tracking system. When you're looking for your jobs or you're looking for the schools you want to apply at, look at the application applicant requirement um, and they use some keywords. Try to incorporate those keywords into your resume because once your resume gets into the system and there are filtering out the candidates that match the best needs, those keywords are going to help you out a lot. Um, proofread your resume. Um, don't just make it and be like, okay, this is it. I'm ready to submit it. Make Read it many times. Uh, activate your proof uh, grammar insights in your Word uh, document, and they will be spell check it for you and make sure the punctuations are okay. Make sure you can ask your mentors, you can ask your teachers, your faculty members at the school that you're attending right now to proofread it as well. If you have a career services at your school, they will help you proofread your resume as well. And again, if you want help in your resume, LinkedIn is going to be your best friend if you uh, ask for help. There are so many people out there, professionals, who are going to look at your resume and give you feedback based on what you should and you shouldn't include. And then some don'ts that we discourage students to do is don't write in first or third person, use a, uh, be a middle person. Don't use chat abbreviation like we use in WhatsApp, like BRB, be right back, LMK, let me know. Don't use that, use full words, just be accurate words. Don't go overboard with formatting, meaning that you're putting pictures of your car, telling them I have this great car, that will be a great fit for your company or your school. Don't put pictures of yourself in the resume. You don't, they don't need to see all that. And then don't misrepresent your education or experience, which means that don't lie of what you have, what kind type of education you have and what type of experience you have. Because if you lie about your education, when you, let's say, finally get into that um, school or job, they can track your track your education through your, your official transcripts. They're probably not going to ask for a diploma in the US. They're going to ask for transcripts. That's the big uh, dilemma in the US. They will never, they might just ask for records, but they really look at your transcripts. Don't lie on your experience because they can always call back to your, call back your employer and double check if you were really working there. And do not, please, I put this in bold, do not include your personal information, such as I am a 21-year-old boy living in soccer, uh, coming from a very underprivileged family, trying to get into this graduate school or trying to get this job. They don't want to know your age because um, in the US, it, age doesn't matter. So you don't need to put your age. Um, you don't need to put your uh, you know, just don't put your picture on there as well. So just eliminate these kind of details, okay? Now we're going to talk about cover letter. Not all graduate schools would need this, uh, but this would be more likely needed when you're applying for a PhD school. Some graduate, some master's level school might need this. Uh, so it's a great idea to have it on there eventually. So I'm going to, uh, populate another poll for you guys. You can just answer yes and no on the screen and you should be able to see the call on your screen now. So you can just, I will give you 10 to 15 seconds to fill it out and we will proceed further. We just have a few people left. Wow, this is impressive. <laughs> okay. Okay. So most of the people in the audience have answered the question. Let me almost share the detail. Let's just give a couple of more seconds for them to answer. So let me go ahead and end the poll now. And let me share the results. So the results are 51% people in the audience today have composed a cover letter uh, and 49% of people have not composed a cover letter. 
um, that's a that's a good number, and we can help you out today about cover letter because not all schools would need it. US has more concept of having a cover letter attached with your resume and your graduate application of stuff of that nature. I'm going to stop sharing the results now and we will talk about um, cover letter. So the cover letter, <clears throat> so the cover letter is basically you right I, I describe cover letter it's all about you in two uh, in three to four paragraphs you are trying to promote yourself to the school or the job that you're applying for and you're telling me why you're trying to apply to this job and it's going to give the admissions committee or the hiring manager a deeper insight of who you are as a person and what you have done academically and professionally in your career so what you can uh, write in cover letter is that what is enclosed in your whole application. And then to, when you're writing a cover letter, do not make the reader guess why you're sending the material to them, why you're sending all these documents to the graduate school, why you're sending all these uh, documents to, why you're applying for this job. You need to explain it to them, what's going on, tell them, uh, which uh, school, tell them the name of the school that you're applying for, tell them what, what program you applied for, what semester of what year you're applying for, and then tell them specifically how you heard about their program, right, if their website has Im Im impressed you, or if it was a family member, or a friend, or an advisor, or a faculty, or a mentor that told you about their program and the university or a company that impressed you about it so much that you are applying for it. So they would just like to hear a little brag about themselves as well. So you would just have to do that a little bit. And then as a student, your job is to convince them to really take a look at your application, make sure that the cover letter is well written and targeted for that particular program. Uh, the department's website is great to incorporate uh, to the main points of the goals of that particular program. That's very helpful as well. And then take the opportunity to really show them your attitude. Success in the application process is 80% attitude. Your attitude will take you places. Um, tell, the, tell them why are you excited about their program and why they should choose you again uh, and for, along with other, like this against the other applicants that you have applied. And then and then provide them anything that, provide them with the information that you would like to highlight that you have written in your resume so they can focus on that part. But do know that you do not summarize your resume in a cover letter. You're just telling the admissions committee, who are you, why this program, why this school, what you have enclosed in your whole packet, and you're sending it to them. Um, here, I will show you an example of a cover letter. And the very top is going to be your information right here. And then the second paragraph is going to be who you are sending to. This is going to admissions committee. It's going to department of psychology. This is the, what is it called? This is the address. And then again, it's going to, it's, it's about uh, application for a master's degree in counseling psychology. This is the whole paragraph that this person has written. You can read it on your own. That's completely fine. I will give you a second. And then in the end, here, they're telling them what they have enclosed. So they have enclosed graduate school application, this, their statement of purpose, their personal statement, and their resume. I will give you a minute or two to read it, and then we will move forward. Can you please raise your hands on Zoom if you are done reading and then we will proceed further on. That's great, I see people raising their hands. Okay, so tips, a little bit, some tips about um, cover letter. Explain how you can help them. Um, you have to tell them why should they choose you again. This is very important. Uh, why 
shouldn't they choose someone other than you? So you just have to promote yourself, be that BMW in that market, be that product that everyone wants to buy, be it BMW or Mercedes. Discuss your skills briefly. You don't have to go like in depth because you have already written down in your resume. So tell, give them one skill that uh, really highlights above you. If you're a bilingual or if you know more than two languages, put that down um, and then personalize the cover letter. That means that you have to personalize it to the department that you're sending it to. If you're a business major, make sure you are personalizing it to that way. If you're sending it to a school of psychology, you're uh, personalizing it to the school of psychology. Then some don'ts would be don't repeat content from your resume or your CV because they're eventually going to look at it. So there's no reason of uh, redundancy. redundancy. Uh, so you just don't repeat the stuff that you have already written in your resume or CV. And then you don't have to write four or five pages explaining them why they should take you. Um, three, four paragraphs should be enough. You can brag humbly in your uh, personal statement or purpose of uh, statement, statement of purpose, uh, why they should choose you. And then don't make any confessions to them that I will be the best kid if you uh, take me and I will change wonders in the program when, if you choose me and stuff of that nature. Don't make confessions of such type. So that concludes my presentation. This is our information where you can go online to this web page and register for free advising services. You can access our upcoming events as well. Um, this uh, here is my work email. You are more than welcome to send me an email if you want us to review your resume or a cover letter. We will be I will be more than happy to do that. Um, we are also on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, we have a lot of sessions that other advisors do across Pakistan that you can access to. Do as I said in the beginning, I have another session that's coming up next week, which is your five steps. And we're going to talk about all those five steps in details. So please do sign up for that. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and type that in the Q&A and I will start taking it. Do know all of our services are free. So if you do want to schedule an advising session with us, you are more than welcome to sign up for that as well. So we'll start taking your questions from the Q&A box now. Yeah, so there's a comment, shouldn't the address be the present mailing address? That's true. I was just using an I was just using an example. So just make sure you do give them your current um, address that you are living in right now. Okay, so that's there. Uh, Khan Sal Salam, your query is very particular. Um, I would need more details. If you can just send me an email and we can probably schedule an advising session, um, we can talk about it. So there is a question, do we have sample templates or perfect CV for a candidate applying for a PhD admissions? So there are samples, uh, sample templates on Word document. Um, if you can just go on the Word and on the file, you go into new and then type in resume templates, it will show, it, show you up. Also, if you go on Google and see how other people have their resume for PhD, that will give you an idea um, of how to create a resume. Uh, is it okay if you add internships? Of course, yes. Add all the internships, paid or unpaid. Just make sure it's within eight years of the period. Uh, whether we need to use Harvard, Stanford, or MIT CV format for PhD, application, I'm not understanding your question, but are you talking about how to cite your publications? Or um, can you please give me more details on your question and probably email me? Can we add metric and intermediate education? That's a very good question. If you have received your uh, bachelor's degree, then I will just say that eliminate that. They would know that you have a bachelor's degree. 
then that means you have completed your basic education, your metric or intermediate. If you have completed a basic language course, such as Spanish language course, where you aren't um, much fluent in that language, could you still add? I would not recommend that you add. If it does have basic skills, then no. But if you're fluent in Spanish, then yes. Can we write certifications that we haven't completed yet, but are close to completing? No, you only, it's an education, yes, of course, I was talking about it, but um, when it comes to certification, you only add those that you have completed. Is the cover letter and CV the same? No, they're completely different. Okay. Um, So I'm seeing a lot of uh, questions are more about getting admissions into the universities. Uh, please send me an email or, or register on our website for advising services and you will be assigned an advisor and they will reach out to you and you guys can have a conversation with them or send me an email and then we can talk. Okay. What are references? Uh, references is something, let's say you did some research while you were doing your PhD uh, or while you were doing a research for publishing your work online and you used an article to get some data out of it or you used a website to get some data out of it. So you're going to add that particular website or article in your references so that it doesn't seem like you just plagiarized, which means you just copied and pasted someone else's content and made it your own. Okay. Um, So if you haven't published anything yet um, and you're still doing your research, then no, you don't add that on your resume or your CV. However, if you get selected or shortlisted, you are more than welcome to talk about it during your interview. Okay. So someone said, I will be applying for an engineering program, but all my work experiences is in, are in management roles. Do I, do I mention them in my experience? Are you changing your field? I would need more information on that. If you're changing your field, um, it becomes a little hard. Um, maybe you have some kind of volunteer work or internships that you might have done in that area. Uh, you can add that, but I would just need more information on that. Do you recommend inserting personal photo in CV or resume? No, not at all. Please don't add your picture. Uh, what about date of birth and personal information? No, you don't have to include your date of birth. So uh, poetry is not a skill. So no, I don't think you can add that in your resume. <laughs> Uh, personally, it's a good skill, but not to add on the resume. So I was talking about honors society uh, that you can be a part of in the US, but you need to get an invitation uh, to get into that society. And that's highly dependent on your GPA. If you have a great GPA, they will invite you automatically to get in. If anyone has a low GPA, should he or she mention it on, on CV? Um, if you have, if you're not feeling confident about your GPA, then it's recommended don't add it. If your GPA out of on the scale of 4.0 is 3.8, then yes, of course, add it. Okay. Yes, you can email us your resume for review, that's fine. It's not mandatory to add your image, no.
Okay, again, I'm seeing a lot of specific questions about changing your majors and um, applying to schools. I would recommend sending it or sending me an email and we can have an advising session and I can advise you based on that because I would need more information to advise you. Should we bold a few words that are important? Um, no. Uh, if there's something that you would really like to highlight on your resume or CV, then put it on your C on, on your cover letter and the admissions committee or the hiring manager will look at it. But if you would like to uh, bold your name on resume, then yes, you can do that. What do fresh graduates include in experience box? That's a really good question. I was actually looking so for someone to ask this question. So it's very obvious that fresh graduates would not have a lot of work experience, but when you're getting into school and you know that you're planning to get into to the US, you should know that any kind of experience would matter there. You can, if you don't have any work experience, if you have volunteered somewhere, go ahead and put that experience in there. If you have any internships, paid or unpaid, you can add that on there as well. I know a fresh graduate resume would be very, um, very concise to what they have been they have been doing, but it's still a resume. You can add your skills. You can still have a professional summary that can say that you just graduated with this degree, and this is what you're trying to do once you get into the graduate school and then in your professional life. Uh, you can add your language skills. If you have done any kind of certificates, do add that as well. But it do get very narrowed when you're adding your experience because you might not have a lot of experience because you're still, you just graduated. So yeah, that's very understandable. Okay. Do we have to mention specific universities in our cover letter? Yes. No, I mean, um, for Fulbright. So this session is not for Fulbright. Um, no, it's, it's not for Fulbright, sorry. Can I add a GPA which is near 3.5 out of 4.0? Oh, yes, I, I think it's okay to add. Well, it depends are you if what program you're applying for. That depends on the program. Is there a limit to the length of a resume? Yes, uh, it, there is a limit. It's very much recommended and it's best if you have a one page resume, but no more than two resumes. Uh, sorry, no more no, no more than two pages at all. I, I really want, uh, I would really highly recommend to have one page resume only. Um, can experience be on the top of CV? Mm, you can, uh, on top of CV, no, it has to be some kind of content before your resume on, uh, on your CV. You can just not start your resume or a CV with experience. Okay, the other about personal statement and purposes, uh, statement of purpose, there are a lot of videos on our Facebook pages, on Facebook page, you're more than welcome to access those. Uh,
A lot of questions, do we need to add metric and intermediate details? If you have your bachelor's degree, then you don't have to add them. Can we add poster presentation in the conference section? No, you don't have to do that. You can just put in the title of your conference. How many certification certifications should I write down on my resume? So if you have like six uh, certifications on your uh, on your profile and you're in there in different areas, um, if it's relevant, put down, let's say if you're applying for business school and you have six uh, certificates that you have done, four are in computer sciences and two are in business, then write those two down. So make it personalized, uh, personalize your uh, resume based on the program that you're applying to and personalize your experiences and certification based on the program. So I'm going to take a last question and then we will end this webinar. Okay, I'm trying to find a great question. If you do not have any publications, how can I make my CV better? Uh, you don't have to have publications uh, on your CV. As I said, as I said earlier, that um, the PhD itself is going to teach you how to publish, uh, how to do research and publish. So uh, don't worry about it if you don't have any publications. If you do have any publications, then you can go ahead and add on to your CV and you can send it to the graduate school. So that concludes our session today. Again, if you would like to sign up for our services, you can go on the website here and register yourself. You can also access to our upcoming events. If you have, if you, a lot of uh, questions were about personal statement and statement of purpose, we have done a lot of uh, video, a lot of sessions on those before, and they're posted on our Facebook page, so you can access them, them from there. It was really a great talking to you virtually today and conducting this session. I will be, um, I hope to see you guys on the next session about your five steps uh, to study in the U.S. Until then, you guys take care and have a great day. Bye.